Okay. Um, well, I think it's uh, time to get started. Uh, people may still join, but uh, I'm very excited to welcome uh, three speakers to this uh, month's webinar on central bank communication. We have uh, the way we're going to structure it today is we have we have three researchers who have all worked either in central banks or doing research on central banks, or in some cases, both. Um, but the focus of today is, is, is social media. It's, it's sort of listed as Twitter because um, I guess, as my kids would say, I'm a bit of a dinosaur. So I think of social media as Facebook and, and Twitter, but they think of TikTok and Instagram and Snapchat and all things I probably don't understand. But um, so, so we'll, we'll, we'll keep it broad, but I know the research is going to be about Twitter. So, so that's at least uh, appropriate. Uh, we're going to split it into three short sessions of about 10 to 15 minutes on research. As always, if you're in the uh, uh, audience and you want to ask a question, there is a Q&A function and there will be points at which I'll put questions to the, to, to the presenters. But also at the end, we've left uh, around 30 minutes to talk about doing research with Twitter, the challenges, you know, the benefits how it works how in practice. Um, so, so there'll be plenty of time to ask questions then. But I don't want to use up any more of the time. So I'm going to introduce our speakers. Um, we're going to start. The order we've agreed on is uh, we'll start with uh, Elisa Newby, who is uh, coming to us from the Bank of Finland. Uh, then uh, Davide Romale from, from my hometown uh, and actually my undergrad institution in Trinity College in Dublin. Uh, and then Alina, who is who is actually not in Oxford, but is 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 a is a, a default student at Oxford, but who spent a long time in other central banks all around Europe, has done the full tour. But I'm hoping or guessing is in Austria uh, at the moment. So good. Okay, I've got your places right. Okay, so uh, we're going to start off. Uh, Lisa, do you want to share your screen, and I will sort of start I the do. timer on your on your on your time, and you can get us going, and then we'll move through the presentations. Is that it? It's perfect. It's sharing. Excellent. Brilliant. Thank you very much. So first of all, thank you very much for having me in this seminar series. This is a great pleasure and honor. I'm going to present introduce you to the joint uh, work with uh, Ika Korhonen, our head of uh, research at the Bank of Finland's Institute on Emerging Economies, BOFIT, as it's uh, known, and then uh, Jonna Elonen Kulmala, who is our brilliant senior data specialist. So Twitter and central banks. So uh, my introduction today is based on our current research project. And uh, in this project, we evaluate uh, central banks activity and influence on Twitter. And this exploration is based on a complete database of all uh, tweets by all the central banks in the world until the end of 2021. Uh, in 2019, we also published a paper that, uh, in which we analyzed uh, tweets of the European central banks, their Twitter uh, policies, their Twitter activity, but now we have extended this analysis uh, to the all central banks in the world. And what we do, we also uh, look at their tweets regarding COVID and then networks <clears throat> between central banks. Excuse me. So, uh, some details about the data. So, we have the Academic Research Project Act uh, track license from Twitter. There are some uh, details here, but indeed, uh, our database includes 800,000 tweets. It's a complete uh, database of all the tweets, uh, also including uh, like uh, likes, retweets, quotes, replies and hashtags used. And now I have to say, excuse me. It's this uh, cough season. Um, uh, we then um, enriched this uh, tweet data with, with some um, user statistics. So um, there's the official monetary and fiscal institutions forum. They uh, update uh, uh, a list of uh, central banks on Twitter. So we use that. There's uh, 121 central banks 
uh, we also include uh, BIS, all the federal reserve banks, uh, uh, European central banks, and all the national euro banks. Uh, then uh, what comes to demographic analysis, uh, we take data from the World Bank's uh, economy region income group classification and population data. So why to communicate via Twitter? Well, it's simple, it's free. Uh, this is something we explored in our 2019 paper in great, uh, great detail. Uh, but uh, just to sum up, uh, despite its limit, we, we do believe Twitter is, is a powerful tool for direct messages, uh, messaging to mass audience that central banks should, should uh, use and apply. It en uh, enables also two-way communication, uh, dialogue, a sort of a more personable style. Often central bank uh, subjects are not so, so, so personable, but uh, Twitter can make them more uh, sort of homespun. There are of course downsides, there are bots, there are fake accounts, uh, false information spreading on Twitter. Of course, users, they can become targets of engineered uh, attacks. But still 70% of all the central banks uh, in the world, they have established uh, Twitter accounts, which we think it's, it's uh, quite, a, quite a large number of the central banks. Uh, then uh, uh, what comes to Twitter users, uh, most of them, they follow at least one uh, news account. They follow professional accounts. Maybe the famous people get uh, more attention, but still, most Twitter users do also uh, follow news and uh, current accounts, cu current affairs issues on, on, on Twitter. And there was a Dutch study, a very extensive panel study, um, a survey published this in 2019 uh, that said that, uh, or the result was that uh, Twitter indeed, it can uh, uh, boost uh, current affairs uh, knowledge of its users. So, so indeed, uh, there are some motivations for central banks to, to, to communicate via Twitter. Uh, then uh, what we think is uh, in interesting is that uh, Twitter indeed, is, it's same for everybody. It's very simple to use, it's straightforward. If you think uh, the environment where World Central Bank operate, there's big variations, what comes to tra traditional media landscape, uh, what comes uh, uh, to, to principles, how traditional media operate, uh, very much, uh, much country specific factors. Also, there's a very famous uh, transparency index of, of Dinser and Aiken Green. Uh, their study demonstrates that uh, central bank transparency and decree of independence they vary enormously across the central banks. Again, political landscape, democracy, uh, they depend on country specific factors. But then Twitter is the same for everybody uh, and for everyone everywhere. Uh, keeping these factors in mind, we indeed want to explore how the central banks around the world from poor countries to rich countries, uh, from different uh, decrees of in independence how they use uh, Twitter in their communication. Uh, here are some uh, numbers. So Twitter indeed, as you know, was established in, in 2006. Bank of Canada, New York Fed, uh, Bank of Nigeria, they were the first central banks to join in 2008. Uh, peak years, as you can see from this uh, picture, they were 2009 and uh, 2012. Uh, today, about 70% uh, of, of high and uh, middle income countries have if, uh, the Twitter accounts compared to only 11% of the low income uh, uh, or central banks coming from low income countries that, that have, uh, have Twitter accounts. Uh, here you can see uh, development of uh, central bank 
next tweets what comes to numbers so uh, annually uh, they have they had central banks had slow start but and by 2010 there was only 25 central banks uh, on twitter uh, Twitter usage of central banks uh, has evolved considerably. For example, uh, Bank de France, uh, uh, Danish National Bank, uh, they used to very much tweet uh, interbank rates. Uh, Bank de France uh, every day tweeted uh, gold prices in Paris. Uh, most central banks uh, before 2015, they didn't curate their tweets in any, any manner. Uh, Twitter was just a sort of platform to, 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 uh, for news uh, distribution. Uh, tweets included links or, or then uh, titles of press releases. But this has now all changed. Uh, more central banks are very active, in, engage. Uh, they create uh, environment appropriate content for Twitter. They use more visuals and more dialogue. Here's a map of a uh, number of followers. Uh, India, of course, big uh, English speaking country, it has uh, over a million, or Reserve Bank of uh, India has uh, 1.3 million followers. Again, Mexico, big country, uh, 800,000 followers. Uh, Bank of Indonesia, uh, these are very high numbers. But again, some uh, uh, we've did some some um, uh, account by account analysis of the followers. Um, uh, some central banks seem to have a considerable number of, of bot accounts that follow them. Um, I don't know, there are some cycles of maybe, I don't know, account purification that Twitter as a company conducts, then the follower numbers can go down quickly, but then go up again. For example, two weeks ago, Saudi Arabian Central Bank had only 200,000 followers, but today they, I checked today, they have 800,000. So these numbers are not reliable in what comes to kind of real, uh, real accounts. And I, of course, know that some bot accounts are, are reasonable, but, but not all. And this has uh, impact on when we try to measure central banks activity on Twitter. So we calculate a so-called general, general activity index. Uh, it, uh, it's a sum of original tweets and replies. So these are elements that are not so much influenced by uh, bot accounts, but then retweets and uh, likes, they are influenced by these bot accounts. And uh, there are big differences. So this is uh, all tweets, replies, shares, uh, and likes summed together. And uh, with this, this definition, it seems that uh, Saudi Central Bank would be the most active, followed by the Pakistan, Ecuador, Cuba, Bank of Indonesia. So very high annual activity numbers. And this is year 2021. Then if we only consider tweets and replies, we have a European Central Bank as the most active engaging central bank, followed by uh, Federal Reserve, uh, Reserve Bank of I uh, India, Indonesia, and Louis Fed. So these are all big central banks who have, I'm sure they have dedicated staff who, who can uh, tweet and retweet uh, several times per day. So indeed, central banks are, are very active. OK, so are there factors that could explain central banks' uh, Twitter activity? Uh, so Dinser and Aiken Green, when they consider central banks' uh, transparency, they argue that it is integral to communication. So we could reasonably expect that those uh, central banks that are transparent, they would be also active uh, in, in communicating via social media, such as Twitter. 
So more transparent central bank, more Twitter activity. Then on the other hand, we could also consider that um, if, uh, if a country if, uh, has, uh, uh, or if its citizens have um, access to internet, uh, then the, the, the central bank would also be more active on Twitter. We found a study by Larson and his result was that um, uh, European uh, Parliament members out of election periods were more active in Twitter if the if uh, the frequency of internet use in the in the home country was high. So, are there any links? And firstly, what comes to transparency index uh, that can uh, vary between zero and fifteen. That is the maximum number uh, of this uh, index, and then. Uh, uh, so, so this is the score on the on the uh, horizontal axis, the score from uh, 2019. So you can see here that, for example, Riksbank and Swedish Central Bank almost reaches the maximum score 14.5, and the score can be below two for some low income countries such as Sudan and Angola. And then the vertical axis measures a uh, number of central bank uh, tweets in, in 2019. And from this plot, you can already see with your eyes that there are not much correlation between this transparency index score and then Twitter activity of the central banks. So there are many uh, open transparent central banks who are not that active on Twitter. And then again, Many, many central banks from um, uh, Latin America, especially, that are very active, but not, not transparent. Then the other question was about um, a positive correlation between access to internet in uh, home country and then uh, Twitter activity of the central bank. Now here on the horizontal axis, there's a difference between number of central bank tweets uh, and the average of all central banks tweets. And then on the vertical axis, there's a measure um, uh, between differences between citizens access to internet as a percentage point difference from uh, the average. Uh, so in the countries where uh, citizens use internet more regularly, then on average as central bank Twitter activity, again, is more active than on average, they are located on the top right-hand corner. And again, uh, interestingly, there's not significant positive impact on central bank uh, banks' uh, Twitter activity. So in countries like Indonesia, Pakistan, Thailand, not that uh, good access to internet, but still very active central banks. Uh, then again, Scandinavian countries where over 95% of the adult population have internet access, their central banks are not that active at all. So it seems that these kind of measures do not uh, explain central banks activity via Twitter. Then again, with this database, uh, we can uh, track central banks uh, uh, interaction between each others. And here's a visualization. So it seems that there are four clubs of central banks. Uh, so first of all, there's the size of the node, uh, meaning uh, central bank, uh, uh, and it denotes how many followers the central bank has. And large central banks in the OECD countries, say they have uh, lots of followers. You can see the ECB, Bank of England, Federal Reserve Board, uh, BIS, and so on. But then again, uh, Mexico, India, they also attract lots of followers. Then these uh, uh, groups or clubs, uh, these, they are quite intuitive, actually. So they are marked on these different colors. Uh, Green, it denotes European Union or Euro Area Club, uh, and their central banks are more likely to follow each other. 
then South American central banks, again, they form another club. Banco de España is, is part of this, this club. Again, former colonies of the UK, they have their own purple club here, although this group is a little bit more diffuse. So uh, this was the sort of nice network exercise you can also conduct with this complete data set. Uh, for the interest of time, I, I skip this COVID analysis and just uh, to sum up, indeed, uh, Twitter is uh, important communication tool for uh, many central banks around the world. Uh, again, uh, growing academic literature it's, uh, highlights its importance uh, is, uh, and effects on financial markets. I didn't include liter literature review here, but uh, I'm sure your studies touch upon this issue. Very interesting question is the Twitter activity in Latin America. Uh, it, it seems that the Twitter is very popular social media there and also politicians are very active on Twitter. So this is something we, we will look in more detail. And then just a, a bit about COVID indeed, it seems that central bank Twitter activity increased considerably during the COVID period, especially in spring 2020 and then again in, in, in winter 2021. Again, something we'll look into more detail. But I stop here and I say thank you and uh, Again, very much work in, in very uh, early stage. So thanks very much. Great. Thank you for that. That's a wonderful introduction to it. Um, I'm going to move straight on. So uh, Davide, do you want to get going? OK. And then if you unmute yourself, then you can uh, you have the floor yeah. for 15 minutes or so. Perfect. Thanks, William. Can you hear me? Yeah, perfectly. Yeah. Okay, great. So before starting, uh, let me first of all thank uh, Michael for, for the invitation to this very, very exciting panel uh, on uh, central bank communication and Twitter. So uh, the my talk uh, today is uh, motivated by uh, three stylized facts. Uh, the first one being the fact that, as already shown by Elisa today, uh, central banks have increased their uh, their social media presence, and in particular in relation to Twitter. Um, then we know also from a recent paper by Alena and uh, Michael Ehrman that uh, Twitter traffic is, uh, by expert and non-expert, is certainly response, uh, responsive to central bank communication. And uh, finally, based on the large literature on central bank communication and um, market surprises around central bank communication, we know that every market participant follow closely central bank communication. And let me add that uh, including uh, Twitter related uh, monetary policy treat. So the, the purpose and the structure of my presentation today will, will be around uh, two questions. Uh, so in the first part, I will provide you some uh, descriptive statistics that will partially complement uh, Elisa's uh, presentation, in which I will show you some of the, uh, the recent results uh, we have found in looking at what triggers more um, me, uh, users' engagement to um, monetary policy communication or central bank communication via Twitter. And in the second part, uh, I will show you the results of uh, an empirical analysis that we have been doing on the, the association between social media traffic and uh, bond and stock market uh, volatility around monetary policy announcement. So let me uh, just show you first uh, the results of this uh, recent uh, paper that I've uh, published on the Journal of Economic Surveys uh, with uh, two co-authors, uh, Donato Mascendaro and Zuana Peya, in which uh, we, uh, on top of describing the evolution of uh, central bank communication with the emphasis on uh, social media and in particular Twitter, uh, we, we try to give an idea of how central banks are active on, on Twitter. And so this, uh, I was checking the results on the tweets reported by, by Elisa. So in this paper, we only present uh, some of the data, descriptive statistics for uh, G20 countries, uh, excluding China, which uh, as, as the, the People's Bank of China doesn't have a Twitter account. But what we can see here is that we have information on the year in which the central bank 
uh, joined Twitter, and also we also see a certain degree of activity of, of central banks. In our case, we, we only have 20 or 19 central banks and a total of uh, 215,000 tweets. Uh, and together with this information on the activity in terms of tweet by central banks, we also have some, some measures of engagement by users in terms of uh, likes and uh, retweets. So for example, here uh, we, we know that by looking at the average number of, of likes associated to uh, central bank tweets, uh, on average, uh, there are 19 likes associated and 12 uh, retweets. So next, in a very simple exercise, we try to, to rank a large sample of these tweets, and we managed to do it easily for a subsample of 89,000, roughly 89,000 tweets, and we categorize them uh, into uh, different groups uh, of categories, depending on whether the tweet was referring exclusively to uh, the announcement of the, the release of new banknotes, uh, monetary policy announcements, uh, but also other information for for example, uh, research and conferences uh, and exchange rate uh, information. And then uh, we use this classification to run uh, a simple uh, Poisson uh, regression in which we relate uh, the uh, number of retweets associated to, to the tweets uh, generated by this central bank uh, with the dummy associated to the, to the various topics uh, of, the, of, the, of these uh, tweets. And so what we find is that uh, all of this in general, uh, when we look at the, at the full sample and all the controls, uh, we, we find that uh, the, those tweets that are associated with a larger uh, public engagement or uh, social media users engagement are those uh, related to the announcement of new uh, banknotes and monetary policy announcements. But so uh, we know that this uh, central bank engagement uh, in, uh, with social media has sparked uh, a new and growing literature on communication by central bank and its effects, and also communication uh, on social media about monetary policy announcements. And so the first trend of the literature has provided evidence, for example, uh, for focusing on the Fed, on uh, the role of uh, central bank communication in shaping expectations about inflation. Uh, we know that also recently based on the, on the work done by um, Alena and, and Michael Ehrman, uh, we know that there is uh, the engagement of uh, social media users differs on whether the, the tweets are done by expert or non-expert. And, and this refers mainly to the literature by central banks and how it is connected to the general public. When we, we talk about more at the second strand of the literature in which we, uh, we try to uh, at times employ uh, text analysis techniques uh, to classify large set of, of tweets, we find here another um, paper of, of Michael uh, Herman and uh, his co-author Paul Hubert, in which they, they look at whether uh, the social media traffic uh, before a monetary policy announcement is, a, is associated with the, the magnitude of monetary policy surprises. Overall, this literature stressed the importance of focusing on uh, social media communication by central banks, not only in order to shape expectations, but also to uh, improve uh, communication strategies by central bank. So let me now move on to the second part of, or the second question for, for this discussion today, in which I will show you some of these uh, preliminary results from an ongoing project uh, with Donato Mashandaro and Gaia Rubera, in which we look at the association between Twitter traffic and uh, stock markets and asset prices volatility uh, around uh, monetary policy announcement. So this, this picture shows you the, the total number of monetary policy related tweets, uh, which we have uh, collected uh, in, our, in our sample. And we can clearly see here that for the three central banks in our, in our database, uh, the Twitter traffic around about monetary policy basically spikes in the hour prior and following a monetary policy announcement. So what do we do uh, in, in this paper in a nutshell? Uh, we first of all create this new uh, database of tweets uh, related to monetary policy uh, for three major central banks, uh, the ECB, the Fed, and the Bank of England. And then uh, we, we select a subsample of, of tweets, which we classify as related to monetary policy. 
Once we have this corpus of tweets and text, uh, we, we compute an hourly measure of similarity between uh, the tweets uh, about monetary policy and the text of uh, social um, central bank communication. And then we use a uh, variation in the similarity between the tweets pre and post an announcement uh, to, to, to assume or to, to test whether there is an association between these changes in similarity and market reaction. But so let me give you some more information on how we collected and which is the sample of tweet that we have. So we first of all started with a standard proxy of looking at uh, selecting tweets, uh, which were either mentioning the Twitter ID of the central bank, uh, the nickname of the central bank, or uh, an hashtag associated to the name of uh, the governor of the central bank over the period 2011 and 2020. Uh, for those familiar with the Bank of England, you will see that in order to avoid any noise, we didn't capture any hashtag king as uh, it might have influenced largely the number of uh, noisy tweets uh, that we would have collected. And so this allowed us over the period of the analysis to collect roughly uh, 2.5 million tweets. And when we narrow down the sample to, uh, to the two days around the monetary policy announcements, we had uh, a sample of around uh, 468,000 uh, tweets. But clearly, we soon realized that uh, there were there was many noise, and uh, tweets can be uh, generated by bots, or uh, often there will be tweets about buying and selling uh, cryptocurrencies. And so we try to, uh, to first of all, select a random set of 3,000 tweets, and then we had a uh, classification on uh, whether these tweets could be considered related or unrelated to monetary policy. And we use this preset of 3,000 tweets to train a machine learning algorithm, which will allow, which allowed us basically to split the sample of 468,000 into a sample of a subsample of 228,000 tweets, uh, which were considered as relevant with an accuracy of roughly uh, 79%. Next, when we had the corpus of, of tweets and the text associated with these tweets, we collected information on the monetary policy announcement for uh, the three central banks in our sample, the ECB, uh, the Fed, and the Bank of England. And what we did, and here clearly I selected uh, two, two random tweets, uh, which are not uh, made around monetary policy announcement, but could give us the idea of what will be the text of the tweets that we have. And so once we have the corpus of tweets and uh, the, the text of monetary policy announcement, we compute an hourly measure of similarity between the corpus of tweets and uh, the uh, monetary policy announcement made by a central, by a central bank. Uh, and we compute this similarity as the cuisine similarity between these two vector, vectors. The one on one side, the text of tweets, and the other side, the text of monetary policy announcement. And in terms of empirical analysis, we next try to see whether there is an association between changes in similarity and uh, asset prices volatility around uh, in the narrow period around monetary policy announcement. So uh, our measure of asset prices volatility is captured by as a dependent variable is the realized variance of the returns uh, on various asset prices. I will give you the idea of some uh, in the following slides, uh, but here we look at uh, the realized volatility that is the sum of the square return uh, in the 15 uh, minutes prior and post an announcement for the asset of interest. And our main uh, control variable is represented by the absolute change uh, in similarity uh, as, as a measure to capture how the, the text of the tweets has differed uh, between the hour prior to an announcement and the hour post an announcement. So just to give you an idea, uh, as I'm concerned of, of the, uh, the time in here, but just to give you an idea of what we find is that for uh, the case of the European Central Bank, when we focus on uh, stock market prices volatility for the three major uh, euro area countries and also the uh, euro stocks 50 and euro stock for banks, what we see is that we don't find any association between the absolute change in similarity and uh, market volatility. Uh, however, when we focus at the, at the press conference window for the ECB, we actually find that the larger is the 
change in similarity between the pre and post uh, announcement periods, uh, we find an increase in the similarity. So indicating that the more differences are the view between Twitter users pre and post announcement, the higher will be the volatility of the market. When we look at the, the similar uh, measure of uh, volatility uh, for the Federal Reserve Bank and the Bank of England, we find a similar pattern and a positive relationship also between the change in similarity and uh, the, the market volatility for Dow Jones, Nasdaq, and Standard & Poor, while we don't find uh, much of evidence uh, for the Bank of England. And uh, when it comes next to other asset prices that we analyze, uh, we have here, uh, this, uh, this figure here uh, shows for any point, we have the coefficient estimates of the uh, delta similarity uh, regressed on the asset prices volatility of different sovereign yield with different maturities and for different countries. We don't find money in similar to what we have found for the volatility of stock market. We don't find much of the volatility uh, associated with absolute change in similarity around press releases for the ECB. While we find that when it goes to, when we analyze uh, the uh, absolute, uh, the um, realized variance uh, explained by the absolute uh, change in similarity, we actually find that uh, this, uh, the absolute change in similarity coefficient uh, is large become, and becomes statistically uh, significant uh, for uh, bonds characterized by uh, larger maturities. So just to conclude, uh, in this uh, second project, we create, as I mentioned before, a uh, new database on um, tweets about mon the monetary policy uh, decision of three central banks, the European Central Bank, the Bank of England, and the Fed. We then compute a measure of similarity between the tweets and uh, the text of monetary policy announcements. And, and finally, we provide some, some evidence that large variation in similarities around monetary policy announcement are associated with uh, spikes in volatility, uh, specifically for uh, the use of the ECB press conference. Perfect. Uh, great. Uh, so so there, there are actually some questions that have turned into a discussion but I'm actually going to defer them also because uh, they touch on something that actually I think we're going to, uh, we're going to look at uh, a bit more specifically later. Uh, so I'm going to get uh, 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 Gabriel later from the ECB to talk a little bit about how they use it. And also this issue of that uh, Jean Guillem has asked uh, about about the difference between official Twitter accounts and uh, I don't know uh, these will be my words celebrity governors um, who, who who may have their own uh, powerful influence. So so we'll come on to that after. But but uh, before that, uh, I'm going to hand the floor straight over to uh, Alina. Uh, so Alina, if you want to share your slides and then. Um, yeah, you can. Uh, perfect. That okay, looks good. Perfect. Excellent. Thank you, Michael. And also, thanks a lot for having me today. So what I'm going to talk about now is how we can use Twitter to understand how the general public responds to sentiment communication. And it's nice with an audience like this. I don't really have to motivate the issue much. So as you know, communicating with the general public or with non-experts has um, intensified over the last years and decades, but there are voices of doubts and worry out there as to whether this is effective. And now with Michael Ehrman, we've been asking the question whether the situation is really that bad and whether non-experts actually do respond to central bank communication. And Davida has already mentioned a few takeaways from our paper. That's great. Um, I'm also currently working on something as kind of an extension to this, where I look at different countries within the Eurozone and whether they might respond differently to central bank communication. But for today, I will, so today I will mostly talk about my project with Michael. Okay, so we use Twitter to understand a few questions. First, who reacts to central bank communication? Is it only experts or also non experts? And the brief takeaway is, well, non-experts do respond to sentiment communication, so that's great news, but experts respond more. 
Then there's also different types of communication events. So think, for instance, the press conferences, but also speeches and responses to these different events are actually also different. I get to that. And then we also ask whether um, some tweets get more attention and why that is. And to answer this, we look at likes, replies and ret retweets of tweets. And we find that stronger language, negative language, more subjective language makes a tweet get more attention, which is probably also very unsurprising to you. Now, I'm currently working on something where I look at differences across languages in the Euro area. And I find that responses to sentiment communication can differ depending on the language. And I, ex I also look at belief updating within languages and find um, some preliminary evidence for in-group effects where if agents have a matching nationality or language to the communicator of the central bank communication, so in the Eurozone, the president, then their belief updating is a bit different than other languages or nationalities. So I'm not gonna talk about this much today, but if you're interested, please re reach out. I'm always happy to talk about this. Okay, so why should we use Twitter data to answer questions like these? Some advantages, it's real life data. So we don't have to engineer a signal that people receive. They make it known that they have received the signal. That's why they tweet about it. And that's different to when we use surveys or experiments where we actually impose a signal on people. That also makes us have an avoided Hawthorne effect. So Hawthorne effect is when people modify their behavior because they feel observed by the researchers and we don't have that on Twitter. Although you could argue that people modify their behavior on the internet anyway, but that's a different story. Now on Twitter, we have large amounts of data. That's great because we could never reach these many people with surveys. And in addition, we also have the non-experts on Twitter, not just experts. And it's great because that's the core of our research question. And in addition, it's high frequency data, which especially for non-experts, we don't have a lot of these. Now the high frequency of data also allows us to tie responses to center bank communication events. And because the data also continues, we have a lot of um, different communication events that we can analyze. Now, Michael is going to talk about some challenges more later, but I'm going to touch upon a few things that came up during our research. So, for instance, we don't really know who tweets. People can uh, make up their identity on Twitter, they can lie about it. Um, and the only way to know who tweets or differentiate, for instance, in our case, between experts and non-experts is by looking at people's behavior then Twitter users are not representative of the population necessarily, because as you can imagine, not everyone is on Twitter. And then tweet content, that's something I'm currently working on is the question, what is actually on Twitter? Are people just replicating information when they tweet or do they share their personal beliefs? And if they share their personal beliefs, then what are those beliefs? Are they inflation expectations? Are they expectations about the economy? or might it just be some sentiment about an institution? So that's not very obvious. And how I'm trying to find answers is by actually reaching out to people on Twitter and surveying them and asking about the expectations and then I'm trying to link it to um, their tweets. Now, there's also other problems on Twitter. The platform itself, it might change over time. Then numbers of users might fluctuate. The display might change, so then maybe retweeting becomes more or less appealing. And there's an algorithm that makes tweets more or less visible. And that's a bit of a black box, and it might also change over time. We don't really know. And then finally, and also quite um, recently, um, <laughs> ownership changes. So that might also change behavior or make some people leave Twitter, as we've seen. OK. So back to the project with Michael. We used data between 2012 and 2018, and it's tweets in German or English language. We collect tweets that contain the key words ECB, European Central Bank, or Draghi. And of course, we have to do some data cleaning because especially if you use abbreviations, you will get a lot of tweets that are unrelated to central banking or whatever topic you're analyzing. So we got a lot of English cricket board tweets 
Um, but then we also had to do data cleaning for other reasons. And that leaves us with a final data set of around 3 million English tweets and around 100,000 German tweets. We also scrape information of accounts. We have around a quarter million English users and around 15,000 German language users. And the information that we scrape is when the accounts were created, um, but also how many followers a user has, or, um, um, I'm sorry, and uh, uh, I lost my train of thought of it. So how many followers a user has um, and um, when the account was created, those are the most important. Okay. Now, um, when it comes to the tweet time series, let me visualize this here. So in blue, you see the monthly volume of tweets in English over time. And in yellow, you see the monthly tweets in German over time. And you see that the patterns are quite similar, um, but obviously like the volume for English tweets is a lot larger and um, the red bars indicate important communication events. So what is very promising for us is that these events coincide with the peaks in the time series. But even so, we were um, still comparing our time series to other data, for instance, newspaper articles that are related to, um, so that have the same keywords basically. And by finding that the patterns are very similar to our data that we find on Twitter, we are very confident that what we find in our sample is actually equivalent to the attention that people were giving the ECB at a certain time. Okay, now to our analysis. We look at the content of tweet by running a sentiment analysis. We apply a simple dictionary approach where we are primarily interested in two different sentiments. One is the strength of views that ranges between zero and one, where higher values of text or tweets in our case are tweets that have either stronger negative or stronger positive sentiment and values closer to zero are assigned to tweets that have more neutral language. Then the sentiment of subjectivity also ranges between zero and one, where tweets get a value closer to one if they're more subjective and a value closer to zero if they're more objective, so more factual. The key of our analysis is differentiating between experts and non-experts. And I've already mentioned that we have to look at people's behavior to do this. So for experts, we impose that they're regulars and we impose that they're active at press conferences, at least in 50% of the cases. The opposite is true for non-experts where we impose that they cannot be active at press conferences in 50% of the cases, they have to be active less. And we impose something called ECB centricity where we impose that they talk about a lot of different topics and only rarely talk about the ECB. So the ECB centricity measure is a person's tweets about the ECB over all that person tweets in, its, in their history. And then we say that non-experts have to be in the lower quartile of the distribution. That leaves us with non-experts making up a quarter of our accounts, but they only issue around 4% of tweets. And experts make around only half a percent of accounts, but the issue of almost a quarter of our tweets in the sample. So experts are very active. If we compare non-experts to experts even more, we find that non-experts are particularly active during the weekends or more active during the weekends and during the week. And for us, this makes sense if you believe that experts are also tweeting as part of their profession, so more likely to do so during the week. Non-experts are also more subjective. They have stronger views and cover broader spe spectrum of views. So that means that the variation in our sentiment scores is just larger for non-experts than for experts. Okay, coming to the core of our analysis, that is to the behavior around ECB communication events. So on the left-hand side, we have daily observations of Twitter traffic or tweet volume, or we have the daily values of sentiment or variation in sentiment. On the right-hand side, the coefficient of interest is are the beaters. And for each communication event, we have different beaters, 
And we do allow um, different likes or leads for some communication events in the paper, even though now for simplicity, I'm just gonna stick to within day responses of um, all communication events. We control for day of the week effects, month of the year effects, holiday effects, and time trends. And we estimate this regression with OLS for separately for all accounts, but then also for the subcategories of experts and non-experts to be able to compare between these groups. Okay, what we find here on the y-axis, you have the coefficients, and on the x-axis, you have the different communication events that we're looking at. So these are the responses in tweet volume to the different communication events. Press conference and the whatever it takes statement by Mario Draghi make up for the highest responses in um, to um, communication events. But note that all uh, coefficients are positive and with the exception of the economic bulletin, all are strongly significant. Economic bulletin is still significant at the 5% level, um, but it is a bit smaller also in size. Now, um, also note that, especially to what uh, Elisa was saying earlier, here the communication event of um, the central bank, the ECB tweeting on a day where there's no other um, central bank communication is still positive and highly significant. So in the central bank accounts, tweeting actually has a positive impact on people's response on Twitter. All right, so other communication events that we account for is the monetary policy accounts, speeches by the president, and speeches by other board members. Note that speeches by other board members is significantly smaller than speeches by the president, which you might already have expected. Now let's look at non-experts and experts. Here in yellow, we have the non-experts. And note that all the effects are still positive. So, so central bank communication has a positive effect on um, tweet traffic by ex non-experts. So they do listen and respond, um, but not all of them are significant. So for instance, economic bulletin loses significance and speeches by other board members. But again, you might have expected this anyway. And now if you look at experts in comparison, we see that for most of the events, they have a larger effect um, in terms of their response. And again, you might have expected this. There is one um, communication event, which is the whatever it takes event, where non-experts actually, they have a stronger effect than experts. And that also leads me to the next point that the different communication effect, uh, events are actually very heterogeneous, not just in the um, tr Twitter traffic that they generated, but also in the sentiment that they generated. So um, let me conclude that not every central bank communication event is the same. Some, like whatever it takes, trigger a very controversial discussion where views also diverge. So the variation in views um, has, is increasing because of these events. But for the most part, central bank communication is actually making tweets relay information and thereby tweets become more factual and moderate and homogeneous. So the variance between accounts in terms of sentiment falls. And that's particularly true for non-experts when they respond to press conferences. Now, there are differences between the English and German sample. I don't have time to go into this, um, but something else is that central bank communication events to reduce user concentration. And what that means is that more people join the discussion and that um, is a very positive thing. Also, finally, if you want to have a tweet about central banking that goes viral, then the tip is to have negative, strong, or subjective language, because we found that these tweets get retweeted, liked, or replied to much more. And um, with that, I would like to thank you and hand back to Michael. Uh, excellent. Thank you very much. Um, uh, th there are still some questions coming in, but I will come on to those in a moment. But uh... Uh, I am going to, uh, since you brought in experts and non-experts, I think it's time to bring in our expert. Uh, so, uh, Gabriel, um, if you don't mind um, 
this was not planned, but uh, I think uh, earlier, uh, Elisa, you said um, that you know some central banks had like a dedicated staff and and uh, tweeting and retweeting, and at the same time, the ECB was way up the top of your list. So mm. I thought we have somebody from the ECB's communication department. So uh, I thought it'd be right to uh, let him tell us about his dedicated team of experts. <laughs> Yes, thanks a lot, Michael. Um, just a couple of questions. It's a super interesting presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, that also kind of tie with some of the own analysis that we do here in our own team, our own analytics team, that looks, of course, of how our own communications activities are performing. Maybe on the first point, uh, we do have a digital content team that runs our Twitter account. It's not that we tweet or retweet, we actually produce that content. And it leads me to a second point, which is also a question in the, uh, in the text. Um, as you, as those of you who are interested, might be following uh, Christine Lagarde's uh, 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 Twitter account uh, that is also run by the team. Um, and that, I think, brings up a very interesting point that was mentioned. Uh, I've just looked at the latest numbers. Uh, in fact, our president is more popular than our institution uh, on Twitter in that she has 763,000 followers, whereas the institution is 743,000. Uh, um, now that makes us probably a bit special, but I think if you if you go across different central banks, you might also find that in some cases the governor uh, uh, chooses to be uh, uh, also on Twitter, um, and that then kind of can boost, so to speak, the uh, the outreach on that platform uh, more. We also have our a couple of other individual board members, uh, Isabel Schnabel who has a, a significant following, especially among the German economist scene, uh, which is a very important audience also for us to reach out to and engage, in fact, discuss, uh, make sure they understand, even though the opinions are not always the same. Um, and also Frank Elderson uh, uh, has also his own his, his own account. Now, how do we ensure consistency between the two? I think um, between Christine Lagarde's account and the ECB account, I think in part we have different audiences. The, the people who follow Christine Lagarde often people, of course, that she brought from her time when she was the, uh, the managing director of the IMF. Um, we have a lot of uh, people there who uh, are great admirers of her as a, as a woman in a leadership position um, and as an inspiring role model. Um, and so that also means that uh, some of the things that we put out is content that is clearly institutional content that uh, 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 goes out on the ECB account and then gets retweeted by Madame Lagarde. To speak and there's other things which are just on her accounts like when she meets particular people uh that uh that uh, uh or two years or three years into her into her presidency at the ecb uh, look back a small video or something like this which is clearly hers uh and that's uh so, so we, we speak uh we retreat uh differently um, I just wanted to, uh, before before I tune out here from this one, just to use that time to say a couple of things of how uh, we have also found out how engagement would work. I heard some of the analysis. Uh, believe it or not, we have found out, of course, one of the biggest difference of whether a tweet is successful or not is whether it's got a visual. And in fact, if it's got a visual of Madame Lagarde, it, it massively increases uh, the engagement rate that people like it or retweet it. So that is uh, uh, a, a very interesting point, maybe also to, to bear in mind. Uh, Alina also spoke about strong language. We also found uh, that unexpected content, if I may say so, has been particularly successful in being going viral. And here I, of course, refer to our Valentine's Day tweets. Um, which uh, regularly uh, cause a lot of reactions, uh, either people being surprised and finding it, it it's funny or interesting, and others who are, are dis uh, dismayed or, or shoot back with something similar. We usually have a, a little poem there. Um, so that's uh, maybe also something uh, interesting to, to, to analyze. Uh, the final point I wanted to make, and I see possibly here on the list of participants, maybe they have something to say, uh, is what we've heard, for example, from colleagues in, in the Central Bank of Turkey, that uh, having a Twitter account and basically having a chance to directly communicate with people is very much, is very important, especially if you are in a situation where particular views of how the economy and monetary policy works are, are, are given and basically the entire media landscape is not at your disposal to uh, to bring out an alternative view of how interest rate works uh, or, or how monetary policy works. So kind of one of the view ways of actually uh, kind of bringing out 
um, a particular view of economics that is probably closer to the mainstream uh, is in fact your direct interaction via the social media account. Um, and I think a number of uh, a number of uh, colleagues in central banks in emerging markets have similar things, especially when it goes around. Uh, 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 if you want um, rumors about the stability of banks, about um, cash, and so on and so forth, that uh, where things bad things can go very 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 fast, and where a central bank actually needs to be super attentive and super quick in reacting. Uh, not least for, for their financial stability, sorry, for their financial stability uh, uh, efforts uh, to keep the, the banking system safe, to set the record straight and try to reach uh, people. So that's maybe a completely new dimension to to Twitter work of central banks. And here I leave it. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thanks so much. Um, well, we have we have about fifteen minutes left, and and I have a, a few reactions and questions, and, I, and there are a few questions there. But I'm going to put them sort of some of them out to the uh, out to the wider uh, discussion. Um, one was it, it's always striking. I, we know that uh, we know that China does not have Twitter, but but actually, and this is a little bit of self promotion. Um, I wrote a paper with some colleagues, uh, Alfred Shipka and uh, Li Xiang uh, at the IMF, where we looked at monetary policy in China. And we actually particularly looked in one section about their social media. And their Weibo use is phenomenal. Um, in fact, if you go back, this is after we had written the paper. Sorry, this is before we wrote the paper. So we, we, we were looking at it at the time. There were points where they were announcing things like open market operations via Weibo rather than via sort of other channels. I mean, so so that you can find, if, I think I'm sure if you Google now, there are things, articles in the West about open Weibo operations and other other such sort of comments on this. So um, just a comment, because because China was mentioned as not having Twitter, but it's not to say they're, they're actually in some ways probably ahead uh, of, of of other countries in their use by, by some metrics. It also touches on uh, Yi Hang Ng's question, which was about population size. So we had a chart in that paper which showed that even controlling for population, their kind of social media penetration or following was 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 pretty good compared to other countries. Um, and actually, relative to other countries, and this is going to bring me on to my question of challenges. Um, which I'll put out and then I'll bring Michael in because he has his hand up and then we can just have a discussion. You can pick up whichever bits you like. You know, one of the one of the challenges is just the following. You know, so, so um, you know, Bank of England, 340,000 uh, in a country of 65 million ballpark. I mean, they're no Taylor Swift. Uh, who, who's who's in the hundreds of mil, uh, hundred and whatever million? I think Barack Obama is up around that 110, 120 million. Um, and we know that of that 340, some of them are probably investors from around Europe, from the US, etc. So they're not even, if we think it's useful for talking to the direct public, you know, they're not even all constituents of the country that the central bank is representing. So um, I guess that is still a challenge. It, it reminds me. It's a tradition I have in this and every paper I do on central bank communication. If I can get a, an Alan Blinder quote in, I will. And um, in his 2018 paper, he said about, you know, central banks will continue to try and communicate with the general public as they should. But for the most part, they will fail. And so maybe my 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 tough uh, proposition is, uh, you know, are, are they failing or, or are, are they falling short? And my last sort of thing to throw in there is, why is Twitter the dominant one for central banks? You know, why not TikTok or, uh, and somebody, Lisa, maybe you'll tell me that you have a database of all the TikToks by central bank governors or, or Instagrams, but, but that's just an open question. Let me bring Michael Ehrman in and then you as a, as a panel can pick whichever ones you want um, and, and, and leave the others. Yeah, thank, thanks so much. Thanks for all the speakers. I think it's a great set of uh, presentations. My question is, is pretty related to Michael's. He sort of nearly stole my thunder. Um, you know, central banks are excited about Twitter. We as researchers are excited about Twitter. It gives us high frequency data, and lots of, you know, big data. So, so this, is, this is really great. I think, you know, what we should try to get at is sort of some sense of cost benefit analysis, right? It's, it's not costless to produce these, these tweets. So, so do we want to do this as, as a central bank, right? I mean, we, we have staff working on this. So 
I think it would be good to get a good sense of the benefits that we get from communicating via social media and, and Twitter here in, in particular. So Michael already mentioned the number of followers is relatively small. Uh, so we have fewer followers that, uh, for the ECB account than, for example, readers of the German Bild uh, Zeitung, which is uh, the German tabloid. If you ask people, where did you hear about the ECB, if they ever heard about the ECB, you know, hardly anyone tells you uh, Twitter. So I, th I think, Elisa, you have amazing data. You know, if, 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 if it would be possible to understand whether we reach additional people via Twitter, uh, you know, how, are the people who follow central bank Twitter accounts, are those people who anyway follow uh, central bank communication for professional private interests? Or are these people we really reach in addition? I think that could help us understanding a little bit also the benefits of uh, reaching out. Do we actually reach more people via these uh, channels? I think that would be really interesting to understand. And one other related question, maybe to Elisa as well, given that you have so much knowledge now about all the central banks worldwide, the ECB also does these Twitter Q&A sessions. So it's not only that we tweet out, but you know, we have some board members who are there for an hour uh, answering questions on Twitter. Uh, is this a, a practice that we also see in other central banks? And, and you, to, to, can you see how successful that is? Thank you. Yeah, that's a, thanks a lot, Michael. So unfortunately, our database doesn't include, uh, it includes a number of followers, but um, you know, there being millions and millions of followers, it would be impossible job. Maybe we could choose uh, one, one or two central banks, but go through every follower. That would be impossible. Uh, what we do know is that most uh, young people's uh, social media is, is the, the, the number one news source uh, for them. And uh, uh, again, at least we can um, reach sort of professional uh, audience via, via Twitter, people who are uh, more active, more liberal, interested in, in, in uh, public affairs. People, uh, Twitter is still a good channel to, to reach there, but as Michael was saying, it's definitely not, not a channel to, to reach a, a sort of a nation a wide audience. Uh, then, um, sorry, what was again your second question? It was about... Uh, Mine, this was the Q&A sessions. Is this something that sort of sticks out? Is this only the ECB doing this? And because that generates yeah, a lot no, at, one hour, so. Yeah, very, uh, actually, uh, Bank of England, uh, uh, in my knowledge, was the first central bank to start these Q&A questions. And, and, and again, numbers uh, do not necessarily tell about quality um, uh, of the central bank's engagement. That is also a difficult uh, thing to measure. Bank of England is very active. They use, uh, 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 they, they, they quote tweets from uh, all their, all their uh, uh, outreach groups starting from uh, Church of England. Um, I think even us here at the Bank of Finland, we are very liberal, but uh, I think they are even more outreach than, than us. Uh, and how we try to extend um, our, our outreach is, uh, I'll just show you quickly, we allow our staff members to to communicate freely in social media and we have these uh, uh, kind of uh, recommendations how to behave there what to do but this also helps us a lot because uh, when when it's uh, people themselves with their own faces they communicate about their jobs that makes it much more personable and uh, indeed our governor Olli Rehn he has more followers than our our institutional account, so so this is something we've found very efficient. Uh, about a uh, little bit less than forty percent of the Bank of Finland staff members have their Twitter accounts. Have Twitter accounts. Okay, uh, G Gabriel, Sorry, do you want to tell us? Do you, do you want to tell us why Twitter and and not TikTok?
Yes, hi, thanks. I think uh, why not TikTok, why Twitter? I think I think when uh, when central banks started going on Twitter, it was essentially an extension of, if you want, the journosphere. Uh, a lot of journalists were on Twitter. It was where you get in real time, you get past the information, uh, and that's where you first went out. And I think one thing that's very interesting to uh, to maybe analyze further is how many central banks are actually engaging on Twitter, because how many people, many people started to use these channels essentially as push channels, as another another way to publish and get the word out about stuff they would otherwise uh, stick on the uh, on the on the on the on the website. I mean, let's not forget in the old days we would stick uh, uh, press releases on fax machines. That was how you know you would get the word out. And then as new platforms came out. You start using them, and we find uh, in the ECB's Twitter account that most of uh, the people there are, in fact, experts, they're journalists, they're economists, and so on and so forth. Uh, we've now branched out in a place like uh, Instagram. We have found out that it's got a lot more, a lot younger audience and a lot more women. In fact, there's another uh, very important point is that our Twitter audience is predominantly male. Um, uh, and, and if you really want to reach uh, different people from the usual crowd, so to speak, not our comfort zone of people with whom we generally communicate, but people beyond that, we got to move on different channels. And, and clearly, uh, Instagram is, is one of those. We also had a discussion whether we should go on Facebook. And we've been looking around. And I don't know whether anyone from the Federal Reserve is here. But I think we've looked at some of the experience of others and decided against it. One of the reasons also being that this is more of a, of a place to engage. And uh, and as I said, it'd be interesting to say how many central banks actually respond, uh, given that many of these uh, platforms are, are places for people to vent uh, and, and, and throw abuse. Um, so that kind of gives a little bit of a notion of, of uh, how the, the platforms are actually used by central banks. Thanks. Yeah, it, it was interesting. I noticed in, uh, I wrote it down as a note, uh, in Davide's presentation, um, in your numbers, the number of replies by central banks is is shockingly small. By which I, you know, that that where they reply to someone else's tweet. Uh, so, Davide, do you want to take up any points you want, and then I'm going to come to Alina, and Alina, you can tell us. There's a question in there about uh, uh, from Jonathan um, uh, Bechamal, um, which asked about languages, and since I know that's one of your uh, chosen specialist topics. I'll hand that to you to finish on. But uh, David, do you have anything you want to chuck in? Yeah, maybe I, I will actually share uh, this table from from the paper just to show that uh, if we look at the number of followers uh, that that we have in the in the first project that I presented, we see that certain central banks they have more followers uh, on on LinkedIn. Uh, but uh, so just to answer the, the question on why is Twitter predominant, I think that it allows up until uh, the, the new extension of the, the li word limits, it allows a simple and straightforward communication, uh, which is important, I think, for uh, for central bank. And uh, when when Gabriel was mentioning about the visual um, messages, I, I got to the mind uh, the the famous YouTube video of uh, the, the Bank of Jamaica. Um, and when he mentioned the number of followers, uh, one of the, the problem I experienced in, in the selection of tweets was that uh, if you check on tweets uh, at ECB, you will find that many people will, will tweet about uh, the ECB underscore cricket, which is the uh, England and Wales uh, cricket board, which has many more followers than Twitter. So my, my impression on why should we focus on Twitter, uh, at least at the moment, is that um, up until a few months ago, the API was easily accessible uh, for policy institutions relatively, but also for academics. So it was possible to get uh, this, uh, this information. And um, certainly one of the challenges, and then I will pass the, the ball to, to Elena, is, is the language. Uh, and in our case, just to give you an example, out of the 215,000 tweets which we analyzed in the first project, we had roughly 50% which were in a foreign language. So I will pass the, the ball to Elena. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, that doesn't surprise me at all. And 
especially if we talk about non-experts on Twitter and if we're interested in their response, then I think going into the national or the local regional languages is really important, especially in the Euro area where I think we only have Ireland and Malta who have native English speakers. So I think um, to understand the general public better, taking languages into account is important. And it's also interesting coming back to what Elisa was showing us that some of the Euro system central banks are not very active on Twitter. So um, I saw the Bundesbank was at the very end of one of your charts. And I think there's still scope for improvement if communicating via Twitter is um, valuable for central banks. Okay, we, we are right around the time limit, but I had one last question um, and uh, I, I hope I don't open a complete can of worms, but I, I just think I, I think some of the some of the people here would be interested. Be, they're here because they're interested in doing this research. They might be at a central bank. They might be they might be a, a researcher. They might be a student. So. Does anybody want to comment on. The, the logistical difficulties. So Davide, you were mentioning the sort of the API. We know that this has been an issue, whether it's shutting down, whether it's not, you know, what you'll be able to access, what you can store. There are huge issues for those of us uh, in Europe who, 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 who know of GDPR and what that means about information holding and management requirements. There are also questions of ethics, which Alina, and I know about because when whenever she wants to do something with her data, it's usually a form and, and someone has to sign it. Uh, and I'm the uh, person who, who gets to sign them at the moment. Um, so, so so does anybody want to comment on any of those 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 aspects of the research job with with with, with Twitter data? Okay, I'm going to call on someone then. Uh, Michael Ehrman, I know, I know you've had you've had challenges with this because I heard you talk about this at the Ricks Bank. So now it's I'm going to force you on the spot. That's perfectly fine. No, no, I think this is really important, and Alina is very well aware of this because it affected our joint project. So, uh, tweets, according to European data protection laws, are considered private uh, data. So watch out if you use them. I mean, we were signing a long document with our data protection officer, and that's precisely why I ask this question to Elisa because we you know, so we were only allowed to filter tweets that actually talk about the ECB or talk about uh, Draghi or Lagarde. We cannot, we were not allowed to look at uh, Twitter accounts and their tweets uh, only because they follow the ECB, for example. This was, was not considered legitimate in our case. Um, so, you know, watch out if, if you do these things. Um, that's yeah, it did. Thank you. Okay. Good, right. If there's nothing else to add, I, I would just like to thank uh, all of the speakers, um, th those who I, you know, who came with their presentations, and 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 the two usual suspects who I I lured in with their own expertise on this. Uh, I found it I I exciting. I'm still gonna wait for the Lagarde ECB TikTok account because I think that's how we're gonna get to the the younger audience. But um, maybe I'll be left waiting. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, I'm gonna. Uh, close it here but on behalf of the audience I will do the clapping uh, for all of you and uh, yeah the next the next meeting is uh, in about a month in 20th of April and I look forward to seeing as many of you there as possible and so uh, have a good next month everybody thank you very much have a nice thank evening thank you thank you